Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Paul Power and I'm the CEO of the Refugee Council of Australia. I'm speaking today from out of southwestern Sydney, where the lands of the Darug, Darawal and Gundungurra people meet. Uh, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, water, sky and community. And I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Before we begin the webinar, uh, I would like to introduce you to Uncle Des Dyer, uh, who has recorded a welcome to country for us to use today. Uncle Des is a Darug elder born in the gully in the Blue Mountains. He and his sisters were moved to a mission in Granville when he was about 10 years of age. He attended the local school and started his trade as a blacksmith on the railways. He later worked in many roles, including as a machine operator at a can man manufacturer, at an abattoir, petrol stations, an ice cream van, and an employment service provider. And he completed a diploma in community services. As an elder, Uncle Des has supported many young people going through the justice system. He taught cultural awareness and Aboriginal history at TAFE colleges, schools, Macquarie University, and to the wider community, conducting Aboriginal heritage bush tours and cultural walks. He's also been involved in archaeological surveys and provided advice to government departments on relevant cultural issues. I'm Uncle Des Dyer, a Derek Elder. I'd like to acknowledge my ancestors, the traditional owners of the land, and any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander in the room today. A welcome to country was a part of our dream time. It became a part of our dreaming and become law. And what it is, is you would wait at my boundaries before you can come on to our land. And you'd send either a message stick, sign with a message stick, or you'd light a fire and we'd see it. The land of the Derrick Nation it starts from Little Hartley up in the mountains, runs along the Bells Line Road to Richmond, along the Colo River to Brooklyn, from Brooklyn along the Hawkesbury, all the way down to Hornsby, into the Sydney Basin. From the Sydney Basin to the mouth of the Georges River, and it runs all the way out to Liverpool, Cam Campbelltown, Aspen, Camden and back up along the Nepean River all the way up to the mountains. There is 36 clans, 132 dialects. So tonight, or today, whatever, <laughs> I'm welcoming you all to the Derrick Nation. So welcome everyone. Thank you, Uncle Des. Uh, this webinar today is the fourth for the new format of our Refugee Alternative Series. This format replaced the two-day conference that we previously held, and it allows us to have more regular webinars on priority topics. Today's webinar will focus on growing Australia's role in global refugee resettlement against a backdrop of increasing urgent need globally. The speakers today um, are Fatima Yusufi, the captain and goalkeeper for the Afghanistan women's soccer team, Luna Gawi, the Australia and New Zealand co-director at Talent Beyond Boundaries, and Abang Anadi Otho, a national refugee ambassador. Fatima, Abang and I were among the people present at Parliament House on the 20th of March when the Parliamentary Friends of Refugees Group was launched. This is the first time that parliamentarians from different parties have come together to form an ongoing friends group to explore issues of refugee policy. And it's an initiative we've been trying to get off the ground for some years. This group is co-chaired by Labor, Liberal, Greens and independent politicians and has 50 members from across the parliament. We used the launch of the parliamentary friends group to focus on the need to expand Australia's refugee and humanitarian program. At the launch, I gave a quick thumbnail sketch of Australia's involvement in refugee resettlement. Between Australia's federation as an independent nation in 1901 and June last year, June 2022, the nation has resettled or given protection to around 960,000 refugees. 
This figure will pass 1 million sometime in the next two years or so. Of these, 940,000 people have come since 1947, 861,000 arriving through resettlement processes and 79,000 given permanent protection in Australia. While there have been, has been heated and destructive political debate about asylum policy over the past 25 years in particular, Australia's main political parties have supported refugee resettlement fairly consistently since World War II. The Chifley Labor government commenced a large-scale refugee admission program in 1947, which peaked at 89,200 places in the 1949-1950 financial year. The Menzies coalition government, which followed, continued significant humanitarian migration throughout its years in office. The displacement which followed the end of the Vietnam War in 1975 prompted Malcolm Fraser's Liberal National Government to begin a planned annual refugee and humanitarian program in 1977 and to develop a national network of migrant resource centres to support newcomers. His government's refugee program peaked at 22,500 places in 1980-1981. And every government since then has continued the phrase of government's lead, allocating a varying number of places each year for refugee and humanitarian entrance and committing resources for to refugee settlement services. After the Gillard Labor government increased the refugee and humanitarian program to 20,000 places in 2012, the Abbott coalition government cut it back to 13,750 places when it was elected in 2013. Since then, the program has fluctuated significantly. At the height of the Syrian and Iraqi intake during Peter Dutton's time as minister, the program reached a 35-year high of 21,968 places in 2016-2017, but then dropped to a 45-year low of just 5,947 places in 2020-2021 during the COVID pandemic. As you would all be aware, the need for refugee resettlement is greater than it has ever been. Uh, in the past two years, we have seen a rapid worsening of the situations in Myanmar, Afghanistan and Ukraine, and very recently an earthquake in a part of Turkey where many, many thousands of Syrian refugees have been living for quite some years. UNHCR estimates that as of June last year, there are 32.5 million refugees globally. Of these, just over 2 million have been identified by UNHCR as being in need of urgent resettlement this year. But sadly, last year, just 58,457 refugees referred by UNHCR departed to resettlement countries. That's less than 0.2%, less than one in 500 of the global refugee population being resettled through UNHCR in, in last year. In its national platform, the Australian Labor Party has committed to providing 32,000 refugee places a year, taking the refugee and humanitarian intake to 27,000 places and expanding community sponsorship to 5,000 additional places. Unfortunately, there is no time frame for when this commitment will be implemented, but it's clearly a part of the party's platform. Our task collectively is to urge Labor to act decisively to implement this commitment before the current term ends in 2025. We are also encouraging the government to break the numerical link between the offshore resettlement program and the onshore protection program, a link which the Howard government introduced in 1996. Under current policy, offshore protection visas for refugees given protection in Australia, uh, so onshore protection visas for refugees given protection in Australia and offshore resettlement visas are taken from the one program, from the one pool of visas. Trying to manage two distinct programs under one numerical cap has contributed significantly to the massive blowout in the number of onshore protection visa applications which are yet to be finalised. Around 15 years ago, close to 80% of onshore protection visa applications were being decided within 90 days, which was the target. And now the average time frame is 12 months or more. And there are more than 27,300 applications still waiting for an initial decision from the Department of Home Affairs. So we're recommending that, the, that Australia return to past policy and manage the program separately, 
in line with the approach taken by every other resettlement nation. So we need your help to increase pressure ahead of the May budget on the Labor government to begin implementing its commitment to increase the refugee and humanitarian program. Uh, the, we've just put a link in the chat, which you can see there, which will take you to a, an, uh, an email which you can send to your local MP asking them to support this increase in the program. We hope all of you will be able to help us to do this and then share the campaign with your networks so we have as many people as possible encouraging the government to act on their commitment. Uh, today's session is a Zoom webinar and it's being recorded. It will be made available um, after this session on the Refugee Council's website and our YouTube channel. An email will be sent to all registered attendees notifying uh, when it's available and where to find it. You can use the Q&A feature in Zoom if you need assistance from the Refugee Council team. You can also ask the panel questions using the Q&A feature. The panel will have time to respond to questions after each of the presentations. Um, so you can type your questions into the chat when each panelist is speaking, and we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. And please tag us on social the social media channel you're using with our webinar, webinar hashtag, which you can see there in the chat, um, which is Alt Refugee. So now to our first um, panelist, um, Fatima Yusufi is captain and goalkeeper for the Afghanistan women's soccer team. The Taliban takeover of Afghanistan saw Fatima and her teammates flee their country instead of competing in the Asian Cup qualifiers in August 2021. While they've been able to play with great success as the Melbourne Victory Afghan women's team, Fatima and her teammates have faced heartbreak, leaving friends and family behind. Seeing the situation in Afghanistan worsen has made the future of those left behind even more uncertain. Fatima and the team have described themselves as a voice for the women of Afghanistan. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, I think. Um, thank you, Paul. Um, yes, it's a very long journey for me. Um, starting a new life here as a refugee and totally everything was new and being away from the family. Um, at first, like I had no idea about uh, I will be here in Australia, like how far is it from Afghanistan? Because I never like think about like going abroad and um, being away from the family. But something happened and uh, as I just figured out like by the time, um, it's something that's happening to refugees. Um, every refugee that's are, uh, in the world they're, they're like not willing to um like become a refugee because they're facing problems they're like you know natural disaster or something happening that they're like making this decision to go out for us it was a um, big nightmare that we saw our country on that situation and we had to leave the country we had to leave our memories we had to leave our parents and to save ourselves and to save our lives to continue the dreams to continue the work the to continue the the dreams that we had um, as a woman especially in Afghanistan that's hard to um, have your um, sport education everything especially right now um, when the Taliban is there and women don't have their rights um, especially about education they don't have their right um, many stocks in Afghanistan right now and uh, trying to uh, survive, trying to um, trying to uh, have their dreams. And, but it's like, I, I can say it's not an impossible thing. Um, as I'm thinking like uh, by the time I just figured out like uh, when I'm safe here, because on that time when I was in Afghanistan, I made a promise to myself, if I get out, I will help out like others too. Um, and the thing is, the beautiful thing about the sport is, um, I am using the sport as a platform for myself to advocate for others as well. And like true sport, it's amazing because um, you're just motivating others um, and trying to give them the motivation that still there is hope. And we are here and we, we can be the voice for those who are voiceless. And that's an amazing feeling as well. Uh, I'm proud that I have this opportunity to share their um, uh, pains and you know, the problems. 
um, so starting from my um, journey, uh, it just started when I, when we were in Afghanistan and playing normally, going to um, training, um, education. We had the opportunity to go to university, school, everything, but everything just happened like a blink in my idea because the the time the Taliban took over the country, um, myself, I never believed it. I never uh, thought it will be happening to our country, like a big country like Afghanistan. Um, I thought it's impossible, but when it happened, um, the thing is the feeling is so bad because you just realize you lost uh, lots of things. And as a woman, especially, you lost the dreams that you were making through um, in your life on that time, um, especially to be a soccer player. And um, like, it's um, that thing for the mindsets of those people who are thinking like sport is a, um, against Islamic ethics. And it's another thing for women and women shouldn't go uh, with the sport. That was so hard for me. But again, at the same time, I can't like imagine myself without being um, part of sport, without being a soccer player. It's so hard to even imagine. So I really tried hard my best. Our team, um, they did their best to achieve more uh, through sport. And then when those collapse happened in Afghanistan, we were um, trying to um, survive, but there was no open door like we almost like losing our like hopes on that time but miraculously like um this is the effect like a group of people uh who are advocates a group of people that i know know them right now um such as Kalia Popa um our former um captain of the national team that she's based in Denmark and by the help of lots of advocates like Craig Foster um, like lawyers, like Kat Cray from Fifth Pro, like uh, Alison Batson, lawyer. Those are all the people who were like gathering around and trying to help our team. And we are safe here now. Um, we have the second chance. We have the second opportunity to uh, go after our dreams and also to be a voice for those who are voiceless. And not just in Afghanistan, but like I think around the world. As, as I'm thinking right now, being a refugee, I'm just feeling um, every refugee had the pains, different pains. There are not just one story, there is different story that we should hear about. And um, that's the thing, we are here all together to support each other. So um, I think through anything that we are here, um, let's use this and help each other. And um, right now I'm feeling that my sisters who are back in Afghanistan right now um, dealing with these problems too don't have their rights. They can't have the education. That's the important thing. They can't um, go for the dreams that they want, the sport, anything. Um, they can't do anything. That's a nightmare for, for a youngsters, especially to, to understand, to realize that they can't go outside and they don't have their rights. And that's so painful. Um, so we are so lucky that we had the support of these people um, that we are here right now. They had a lot of process. We've been through a lot. The sense of guilt that we um, had been through about our families, that we were like putting them in danger, especially like um, the feeling is so bad because you're thinking like you're guilty because um, you put your family in danger because of your dreams, because of the things that you wanted. But at the same time, you're thinking like, um, you tried your best to be a role model, a person who are motivating others and trying to give them the hopes. That's the thing that I realized here. When I was like in Afghanistan before the uh, evacuation, I was thinking like this, the, the feelings of guilt was a lot. Like um, I was thinking so badly about the parents that um, they're all being in danger because of me. And I can feel it. It's the same thing for all my teammates. Like um, they would have had this feeling that's the worst feeling ever because family is always first. And um, when we were thinking about that and we are the reason and we left them behind, that was the worst feeling ever that we've been through. And, uh, but I have the hopes every time, anytime. Like when I came here, um, I just realized lots of things. I learned a lot of the things by the experience of the evacuation and being on that situation. Um, I'm not losing any hopes. The thing is, I'm always, my message is always like, um, 
have the hopes always because there's always an open door and it's not possible to um, something happen if you just try hard for it. So this is the only thing that we can do, try hard and hope for a good day uh, for Afghanistan, for the countries who are in war. And I, I hope, I wish peace for every country that are um, having problems with the war and they're suffering with that situation and the refugees who are suffering. Uh, yeah, so the thing is, um, I'm really happy um, because of having this opportunity right now. So thank you all. As if there is any question, I'm here. Thank you very much for that, Fatima. Um, yeah, and thank you for sharing so personally um, your experiences of you know of coming to Australia and also um, the pressure that uh, you and others who've been resettled uh, here and have um, family and friends left behind that you feel every day. Um, which I think is, you know, emphasises the absolute importance of Australia trying to contribute um, more than it has been in terms of offering solutions for people who are at risk. So thank you. And certainly an opportunity for uh, people who are watching the uh, webinar today to, to put questions uh, for us to, uh, for Fatima and others to respond to in the uh, Q&A section a little later. Our uh, second panellist is Luna Gawi. She's the Australia and New Zealand co-director at Talent Beyond Boundaries and the lead on operations and the implementation of the Skilled Refugee Labour Agreement with the Department of Home Affairs. She's also a member of the Australian Red Cross's Victorian Division, Divisional Advisory Board and Victorian International Humanitarian Law Committee. She has a master's degree in economics and social sciences from the University of Montesquieu in Bordeaux in France a bachelor's degree in economics from Damascus University in Syria and a diploma in project management. Thank you, Paul, for the introduction and thank you, a Refugee Council of Australia for the invitation to speak today. Uh, I would like to start by acknowledgement that we're injury people who are the traditional custodians of this land where I'm meeting on today. Also would like to acknowledge my uh, TBB colleagues who are attending as well and our uh, global um, CEO, Steph Cousins, she's attending as well this webinar. So hello and welcome. My name is Luna. I am the Australian and New Zealand co-director of Hotel and Beyond Boundaries. My talk today will be focusing on three main points. The global resettlement needs for refugees versus available places, labour mobility as a complementary pathway. Then I will conclude with a video that shows the positive impact on resettlement for Australian communities through complementary pathways, labour mobility pathway, in addition to the humanitarian resettlement. I'll start with a little bit of statistics. The global refugee crisis has more than doubled in scope. In 2022, the UNHCR announced that we had surpassed the 100 million mark for total displacements, meaning that over 1.2% of the global population have been forced to leave their homes. Among these people are over 32.5 million refugees. Another way to display these statistics is simply by saying one in every 78 people are forced to flee their homes around the world. This is quite scary. And just reflecting on these numbers, simple cal calculation here, the world is not doing enough. The numbers of displacement around the world is increasing every single day, but our yearly humanitarian intake is not increasing in the same time, sometimes even decreasing. The mind has turned globally to think outside the box. How we can help more? What other ways can be invented to help out a refugee family's journey to safety and stability? Yes, we need the complementary solutions in addition to the humanitarian resettlement programs. So firstly, what is the complementary pathway for refugee? Complementary pathway is a term often used to refer to a legal pathways outside of the traditional resettlement to to permanent relocation that can be used by refugees to reach places of safety. Examples of complementary pathways are labor mobility programs, educational pathways, family reunion, and community sponsorship programs. There is a huge need for additional complementary pathways to allow more refugees and displaced people to safety to move to Australia. 
I would like also to acknowledge the great work of the community sponsorship program here in Australia. Let me explain a little bit what is the labor mobility pathway. Statistic shows that almost half of the world's refugees are working age, but many find themselves in countries where they have no working rights. 85% of refugees end up in developed countries where they experience severe living conditions. It is about the time to think of refugees as a source of talent that have not been tapped into before. Australia today experiencing massive shortage in skills talent in all the sectors. Globally, 75% of the companies are reporting talent shortages and difficulty in hiring. Let me uh, pause here and introduce you to Talent Beyond Boundary. Uh, Talent Beyond Boundary is an international organization that committed to opening labor mobility pathways for refugees and other displaced people. And let me give you a snapshot of the Refugee Skilled Refugee Pilot Program that TBB is running with the Departments of Home Affairs. The pilot aims to remove some of the barriers to hiring refugees and displaced people from abroad via employer-sponsored skilled migration pathways. The, the pilot launched in 2021 for two years to give 200 skilled refugees the opportunity to move to Australia with their families to work in one of 683 approved occupations. Employer endorsed by Talent Beyond Boundaries can access the program by entering into a company-specific labor agreement with the Department of Home Affairs. With TBB support, employer can access a refugee pool of talent of more than 60,000 of talented refugees registered on TBB talent catalog, which is the database that TBB created where any refugee around the world can register in. The pilot is a practical example of how businesses in Australia were able to fill their labor skill shortages while providing complementary pathways for refugees to find safety and stability. Refugees are able to rebuild their lives, rebuild their career and live in dignity and also to contribute to the Australian economy. It is a win-win to everyone and I can't see anything more impactful than that. To speak of this positive impact, nothing better than listening directly from refugees' experience who moved globally through Talent Beyond Boundaries Mobility Pathway Program. So allow me here to share um, a small video. When we were in Afghanistan, when Taliban came, the woman couldn't have a job. And now in Australia, I have a job, I have salary, I am independent now, and I'm making contribution here. I, I feel like I'm, I'm born again. It's a new life for me. I will not worry about my son's future anymore. Back in my home country, um, I had like personal goals and plans related to my career. After they stamped the visa and I saw it, I felt that this is my personal breakthrough and that it's time to, to make actions and to prove to myself that I can do it. My dreams do come true. There are so many skilled refugees in the camps and their lives are wasted. I think it's really good opportunity for companies that they want skilled people. When you're working here in Australia, you know you have rights to work and you, you are sure that you're getting paid. My family are happy about my settlement in the UK, uh, especially that I'm able now to pursue a higher educational degree and I'm working in one of the best uh, hospitals in the UK. From the first day for me here, I found they are, they are really awesome. I have a dream, I have plans, I have a future goals to achieve. I had to flee Syria in 2012. We couldn't work legally. And we always worried about being sent back to Syria. After moving 
to Australia. Now I'm able to work legally and I have rights. And I secured my job. My children live in safe uh, and peaceful community and can access services and health care and education uh, like any Australian children. Our life have, has totally changed. All the doors were locked actually, there is no life at all. I don't have big goals, just a uh, uh, stable life with my family and uh, improve my IT skills. It's like someone in deep wall and you throw rope for him. We will always memorize these moments. My new life in Belfast is amazing actually. People in Belfast are very nice. Always treat you as a member of their family. You are a human, same as like other people. I'm really having fun, I'm really enjoying my time. After my country fell into the hand of Taliban, I had to leave my country and find a job in another country. I really appreciate, I am so grateful for all the help and support I received. Now I am here in Berlin, living and working. I am so happy and I am so grateful. For sure this is a life-changing experience. I feel very lucky. It is actually like uh, uh, as a miracle happened to me, you can say. Thank you everyone for watching this video. Just to recap, the world's forcefully displaced leave homes and belongings behind when they flee, but they carry their skills, talents, and dreams with them. When skilled refugees can move internationally for work, it benefits everyone involved. Refugees, businesses, communities, and the global economy. Talented refugees are an asset at every level. Uh, a call for action here. To scale this impact, we are hoping to see an extension for the Skilled Refugee Labor Agreement pilot program beyond July 2023, and to design a permanent displaced talent program for 5,000 places in 2024-2025. Also to expand other complementary pathways, such as community sponsorship program, in addition to the increasing the refugee humanitarian program. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you so much, Luna, for that presentation. And um, yeah, and thank you for the work that you and your colleagues Satya and Steph um, and John are involved in, have been involved in for some time in promoting this really clever way forward. As you say, it's a win-win situation where additional places are being found on top of the refugee and humanitarian program for people who've been refugees or are refugees who have skills um, you know, and could actually land jobs in, in countries filling uh, vacant positions. So it's, it's very much a win-win situation. And I think you know, it's quite exciting to see Australia um, you know, at the forefront of, of leading this. Um, and it's a great opportunity you know, for us not only to be collectively pushing for more refugee and humanitarian places, more community sponsorship places, but also more opportunities through uh, this refugee labour mobility um, process and, and also through education and other potentially additional pathways. So thank you for your presentation. Our third panellist um, is Abang Anadi Otho. Uh, she's a public educator, a national refugee ambassador, an author and a researcher. Her journey has taken her from war-torn Sudan through Ethiopia and Kenya and finally to Aust Australia as an 18-year-old. Uh, after, um, after being approached by a modelling agent, Abang felt empowered through her career in international fashion, a role that allowed her to become reunited with 10 family members, including her mother. They had not seen each other since Abang was five years old. Abang has since completed courses at TAFE, a Bachelor of Arts, a Master's of Teaching and a Diploma of Business. Currently in the process of writing her autobiography, and she hopes to share her journey to inspire other young girls coming to Australia as refugees. 
Thank you so much, Paul, um, and hello, everyone. I just wanted to thank you for being here today and for your solidarity with um, refugee people all around the world. So my journey was a very difficult and long journey uh, from the age of five to the age of 18. Um, I was escaping war uh, and escaping from one country to another. I was born uh, in Juba, as you can see on the map, um, in Sudan. At the time, the country was not split. It was just one country. And uh, when I was five years old, my father was facing assassination because of his advocacy for the marginalized people of Sudan. So we had to escape, leaving behind my mother and my siblings. And um, we escaped to a neighboring country of Ethiopia. Uh, in Ethiopia, um, another war broke out and we had to escape back uh, this time to a place called Kokoita, which is back in Sudan. So the war between the Northern led government and the rebels from the South um, was very brutal. And both sides committed terrible atrocities um, on their own people. So we escaped to this place that was uh, held by the rebels. So we were bombed daily in Kokoita. And I witnessed the atrocities and the brutality, suffering and pain uh, of war that no one should ever have to face, especially um, not a child. In this place, all I had known was um, suffering and pain. And again, we had to escape, Kokoita. And this time we escaped back into uh, another neighboring country, uh, which is Kenya. Uh, and in Kenya, um, I felt that normality would take shape. Like I felt like the first time in my life I was able to to go to school, uh, I was able to be normal again. Uh, and I was 11 years old. I really loved school and I put my hand up for everything, for sports, um, for athletics, for debating. And I wanted to be part of the school and I, was, I felt really encouraged. Uh, and also uh, during the time that I was living in the face of war, I really, what kept me alive and what really motivated me to keep going was a strategy that I had developed called the bucket strategy. And that was for me, uh, putting my emotions into different buckets uh, and not to, not to think about everything all at once. And so I was able to uh, compartmentalize uh, my emotions and put them in these imaginary buckets and also to hold on to uh, beautiful memories. Uh, so in Kenya, um, life was going really good. Uh, however, this was short-lived because at the age of 14, my father went back to Sudan and unfortunately he was assassinated and um, we, without trial and up to today, we have not been able to, to find his remains. So I, life changed again. I became homeless and I had to go to Kakuma refugee camp. In Kakuma refugee camp, um, it was a very dry and um, a harsh terrain. However, I knew that, um, you know, this was an opportunity for me to, to be given maybe a second resettlement. So I was very grateful to be uh, to be there because I was given the humanitarian visa to come to Australia uh, on my 17th birthday. So I came to Australia as an 18 year old, um, you know, I was almost 18 uh, at the time and I had big hopes and dreams. I really wanted to, um, to pursue my goals. Um, and I accidentally was recruited into the fashion industry and I traveled the world, but I knew that I wanted to live a life with purpose and I wanted to give back 
to the Australian community. And also I wanted to shape young people's minds uh, by pursuing education. But first I had the big obstacle of searching for my family, whom I did not know whether they were alive um, at, up to this point. So I searched for my mom and my siblings and it was, it was very difficult. It took me quite a, a while. Finally, I was able to, to be reunited with them again under the humanitarian uh, program. I was able to bring my family um, via a different country, Egypt, and then, uh, and then I brought them to Australia. It was a very big reunion and a very tearful. Um, then I also started pursuing the other goal of um, embarking on higher education. And it was not easy um, getting into the uh, pursuing higher education system in Australia. Uh, navigating that was very challenging because at this point I had only six years of formal schooling. So I had to learn the language, I had to learn basic skills. And uh, after many, many attempts and um, undertaking short courses, I was accepted at university and I graduated with a um, Bachelor of Arts and a Master's of Teaching. And then I, um, I have been teaching for the past 10 years, teaching diverse Australian students, both in uh, remote uh, communities and also in the, in the city, in Sydney. And it has been a wonderful experience to be able to, to give back. Um, now I'm an advocate. Um, and it, it has been such a, a, an amazing journey to be able to, to, to also contribute in the refugee space. And I'm also writing a book. I'm an, a mentor um, to young people and leading educational projects um, to support refugees and marginalized communities. And it is so inspiring to know that the resilience and tenacity uh, of the incredible contributions that refugees make to the Australian society. And this is a testament um, that people from refugee uh, backgrounds when given opportunities, just like all other Australians are able to and do contribute remarkably. Um, refugee people are ordinary people who have lived extraordinary lives and, you know, and they are part of the success of the Australian community. I urge uh, the Australian government to, uh, to increase the humanitarian um, uh, intake for, for refugees, uh, because this is such an important uh, program that is really, really urgently needed given the urgent crisis and you know, urgent need around the, the globe at the moment. Um, and I would like to thank you once again for, for your um, advocacy, your dedication, and your humility for standing with, uh, with refugee people. And um, I had to really shorten my story. It's a very, very long story, but if you have any questions, um, I'm happy to, to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Abang, for your, um, yeah, for sharing your story. And I think um, to your um, you know, really highlight uh, the contributions that people who come to Australia through what is essentially a humanitarian program make to this country. I think this is sort of one of the, again, a win-win of Australia's involvement um, in the refugee and humanitarian program. You know, the, the country is involved to provide concrete solutions for people who have act who, who have none, and it's the one part of the migration process which is based around humanitarian need. But what we've seen every year since um, or well, the first refugee resettlement program began you know, in the late 1930s amongst um, Jewish people escaping Nazi Europe, um, is that people who come uh, in situations of when, when they're at a time of humanitarian need um, are resilient people who um, make a lifelong contribution to the, the country, which is given the opportunity to start again. So, you know, it's very much... Um, a win-win situation for Australia being involved, you know, and we can see um, how people who've come as refugees in, in uh, uh, different groups over the, the generations have actually not only 
um, contributed significantly um, economically, socially and culturally to the country, but did actually also expand Australia's horizons and our international links in doing so. Um, so yeah, we're, we're actually now coming to um, uh, question and answers. And so um, there have been a number of uh, questions that have been put in the Q&A and please um, uh, yeah, put your questions um, and we'll, uh, I'll put them to different uh, members of the panel. Um, there's also a couple that have had um, responses so far. So the first question that came in was from uh, Fauzia, who is an Afghan refugee living in, in Jakarta in Indonesia and is asking about the Australian government uh, policy, um, which prevents the resettlement of um, people who've arrived as refugees in Indonesia from July 2014. You know, and this is a policy uh, which the Refugee Council and many um, organisations in Australia have opposed since it was introduced when Scott Morrison was the immigration minister and we continue to raise it with the Australian government as Rebecca Eckhard from the Refugee Council has responded. Um, you know, it's an issue that we're actively taking up and in fact, um, you know, we even had the opportunity um, uh, a week and a half ago to raise it again, you know, with the immigration minister during a, a meeting. So um, we're certainly, you know, trying to draw the government's attention to, to the fact that um, there's uh, a discriminatory um, and nonsensical policy in place affecting refugees in Indonesia. And we're certainly doing, we'll do everything that we can to continue to fight until that's addressed. Um, a second question that was asked, um, uh, which Luna has put in a, a response to is, um, how do you think we can, what, what can we be doing locally to aid settlement beyond community sponsorship? And I'm just interested to, to hear from Abang and Fatima, um, maybe Abang first, you know, for people who are, you know, ordinary citizens, um, you know, not necessarily particularly linked to any refugee community who want to play a positive role, what sort of suggestions uh, would you have? Uh, you mean in terms of sponsorship to contribute? No, of supporting, of supporting um, effective settlement of, of new arrivals in Australia. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's so many things that people can do to support um, uh, refugees. I, I, for one, was really supported by um, organisations such as um, the St Vincent's de Paul, um, and there's just incredible people who uh, welcome refugees and make, you know, make it a, like accommodation uh, available. And um, ordinary people can also extend uh, their, their support by volunteering. And also, you know, there's just so much that can be done. The, like, you know, the work that the asylum seeker um, do you know this they're relying on volunteers so anyone who can who can contribute even their their skills uh, for example for me i contribute my skills in education or in you know in mentoring or even offering um some resources that can be that can be extended um, to people in need because i find that we have too much and we can live with half of the things that we have <laughs> and uh and i'm certainly doing that myself just to 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 really minimize things that I have so that I can extend and support others. Thank you. And, and Fatima, as someone who's come more recently, what, um, you know, if someone asked you, you know, uh, um, how they could support uh, people who are newly arriving in the country, what would you say? Thanks, well, um, I think, and um, in my idea, like because I'm an athlete, and um, because the thing we really needed was like, especially when our parents wasn't here, there was lots of things. The because I had lots of questions in my mind at that time when we came here for the first time in Australia, um, like from especially from case manager. Like on that time, we would have thinking about it, like to how we can go for the education, how we can access to work, how we can have access to as a athlete person, like a sports person, how can I go for the sports? And on that time, we got the support for the uh, sports team, um, like Melbourne Victory, for example, that sponsored our team and um, like we are playing for them right now. So that's a big support because on that time, um, that was the main reason because we were trying to have our um, second chance for being a soccer player again. And it was looking like an impossible thing, but 
when it happens, like it was a very amazing thing, like because we had our second family back. So in my idea, like any support, like especially in case of education, creating chances for the work and this support is the most important one. But the thing is, uh, because of, you know, English is not the first language of all countries. So um, majority needs for that. And that's amazing that we can have those um, like opportunities to have access to that here. And that's amazing. Thank you. And I'd also add, um, you know, that there are many organizations, uh, NGOs that are supporting refugees and also uh, those supporting people seeking asylum. Um, who uh, involve volunteers in all sorts of different ways. So there's, um, I'd encourage people who are interested, you know, to look at the settlement services in their area and what volunteer programs they have, the asylum seeker support agencies, which as we all know, are ridiculously under-resourced um, and, you know, to, to look at what, what opportunities there are to get involved. Um, the, uh, on a similar theme to um, one that you touched on before, Fatima, there's a question which I might put to Abang. Um, do you have any recommendations for migrants and refugees thinking of taking the step into higher education? Someone who's gone through that yourself in Australia. Yeah, I, I think um, never give up. I, I really believe in the power of the mind. Um, and no matter what um, obstacles come your way, there's always there's always a way to, to go around it. <clears throat> and Navigating the Australian, um, the higher Australian system is very, very um, challenging. And because there's a lot of um, steps to take um, and the forms, there's just so many forms to fill. But I find that asking people and actually going and speaking to people in the education sector, uh, there, there's just a lot of great people who want to help. So going, going to them and talking to them and asking for help is, is um, sometimes the, the best thing to do because if you don't ask, you don't get. So it's, yeah, it's, um, although it's very challenging, uh, we need to find ways to support people who are coming from refugee backgrounds or who have disrupted schooling as well, because, um, you, know, you know, having few years of schooling in comparison to a, a normal Australian student who has, had like 13 years of schooling, uh, it can be sort of like the, the gap is, is quite huge. And so it's quite important to provide that support. And it, it doesn't mean that someone is, is, is not intelligent just because they have disrupted schooling. It just means that they need extra help. Right. Okay, um, there's a couple of questions for Luna. One is um, how you promote um, CBB to refugees around the world, including how do you get out to um, refugees in camps and places where they, they struggle to hear um, about a you know, positive program like this. Um, and the other one is just about um, yeah, the, the government's interest in continuing and expanding the Skilled Refugee Labour Agreement. What sort of, um, yeah, so um, got some questions about um, you know, what are the outcomes, you know, what sort of settlement uh, support is provided and, um, you know, what, what sort of interest is there in, in continuing the program from government? Okay, I'll, I'll answer the first question. Um, everything regarding our pilot program is available on our website, telambionboundary.org. I'm just going to post this um, in the chat. Uh, the other thing is that our website is available in multiple languages as well. Uh, the other thing that Telambion Boundary runs program, not only to Australia, we have already established same mobility pathways to UK, to Canada, and we are expanding to the USA and Europe. Uh, so please just check our website. Also, our uh, labor, um, skilled labor agreement is on the Department of Ho um, Home Affairs website as well. Um, regarding uh, yeah, the outcome of the skilled refugee labor agreement, Yes, um, we had a couple of conversations with the government. Um, the government sees um, the importance of this pathways as it is not only a complementary pathway in helping refugees to move to safety, but from the other side, it's helping the economy a lot. Um, yes, we have a conversation of what's next. Um, our ultimate aim as, a, as an organization is not to have a pilot program, but to have a permanent um, skilled um, refugee labor 
sorry, skilled refugee visa in the uh, immigration system that's supporting uh, refugees to move uh, to work. So this is the ultimate uh, goal. Uh, regarding, yes, there is an appetite to continue and to expand. Uh, definitely it's there. We're just shaping how it's going to look like for the short term and how it's going to look like for the longer term as well. Um, I think there was a question regarding settlements um, for this cohort, unfortunately, um, it's not, so the refugee settlement is not funded um, like the humanitarian program, but employers are um, funding that. So they are paying for a light version of settlement services that we feel it's important for the family. So even though this family is moving as a skilled base, but they're still coming from refugees background and they still need some settlement. So we are um, um, looking to multiple ways of how we can help in selling these families. Great. Um, Thank you for that. Um, yeah, and there are there are more great questions uh, in the Q&A, which unfortunately we're not going to be able to get to um, to all of them, but you know, people raising questions about um, the need for um, uh, federal government funding to be restored for English language programs, um, you know, for uh, you know, to address the concerns that many refugee job seekers have in uh, the way in which the uh, employment services push people into any job rather than the, the job where people are likely to be able to make the, the most effective long-term contribution. So, and, and other questions besides. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to remind you all of um, our request that you support um, our efforts to uh, encourage the Labor government to act on its commitment and increase the refugee and humanitarian program. So remember the link um, that's there and, and please um, take it up and encourage other people to participate as well. Um, uh, also, uh, something which I just wanted to draw people's attention to, because I don't think it's actually had any publicity at this point, um, the Australian Government and the Refugee Council of Australia will be co-chairing the International Dialogue on Refugee Resettlement and Complementary Pathways for 12 months from um, July this year through to June next year. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, this has happened before in, in 2012, but it's, you know, it's been um, 12 years since Australia last um, chaired the process. So this means that um, yeah, the Department of Home Affairs and the Refugee Council of Australia and the ATCR Refugee Advisory Group will be working with uh, UNHCR to plan the discussions um, of, at the annual consultations on resettlement and the working group on resettlement, which means we may well be having an event in Australia where people from other resettlement countries come. But it also means that it's a year in which we can encourage the Australian government to act more decisively um, because it has an international leadership position for 12 months on refugee resettlement to act more decisively on the scale of the refugee and humanitarian program, the support that's provided to uh, newcomers to Australia and particularly also the complementary pathways such as the skilled labour agreement, community sponsorship, um, education as a pathway and more effective pathways to family reunion. So certainly you'll be hearing more from the Refugee Council of Australia about that as, as the time draws closer. So I'd like to thank you all for your participation today. Um, thank you particularly to, to Fatima, to Luna, um, and to Abang for the work that, uh, for their presentations um, and you know, for sharing so, so generously um, in the webinar. And also I'd like to thank my colleagues from the Refugee Council, uh, Kelly, Noel, Chloe, and Louise, who've been very heavily involved in the planning of this webinar. As you can see on the screen, there is a poll um, which will be open for several more minutes, um, which gives you an opportunity to um, put forward some suggestions or your thoughts about um, future topics for uh, refugee alternative uh, webinars and also just to give some feedback on today's event. So I encourage you, um, we'll leave that poll open just for a few more minutes um, and encourage you to, uh, to participate in that. Um, the also one other plug, um, Abang is um, one of the speakers in the Refugee Council's face-to-face uh, -face program. Um, and we actually ha now have 37 uh, people around the country, 37 people in six states um, who are available, who do and are available to share their personal experiences, paid speakers, um, to really to build some of the um, bridges of understanding, um, you know, and, and to address questions that people have about 
people who have been refugees and, and uh, what role they play in Australian life. So um, please look at the Refugee Council's uh, website um, and look at how you can help us to support um, local events around the country and you know, giving an, an opportunity for people such as Abang to share their experience about what it means to be a person who's been a refugee and um, is part of the Australian community. So thank you everyone for your participation today um, and yeah, we look forward to your participation and your support for future webinars in the Refugee Alternative Series and, and also to your support um, for our efforts to encourage the government to act on its commitment to expand the refugee and humanitarian program and complementary pathways. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thank you.